Karate Karate. Hey, hello. Ooh, ooh. Oh, chak, pek, gagalo. Ekahuta Hu Ogamde Ch Ch Ekape Magu <laughs> Ogombache Gagalu Okay. When you get to that voice, it's probably time to stop singing and start doing stuff. Greetings, everybody. Welcome back. Welcome to Rack and Rune Hammer. Takate. Um, let's see. I'm setting up my Photoshop file here, clicking things, uh, working on some computer items. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in last night. Uh, here, can you... Does this work? No? Yes? There we go. Great. All of my scenes are all mucked up, so that's fabulous. Um, this looks like this signal's a little on the strong side. Sheesh. Anywho, hey guys. Hi. For everybody who tuned in last night, that was just a sort of dry run uh, test mix for my new equipment setup that I'll be using for the Dungeon DJ, which I think I chose that name well because it's already the first result on the search. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, okay, so doing all that has jiggered up a lot of my um, my OBS setup. So I'll have a couple moments here today where I'm going to be getting my microphone reconnected. Like, I have this huge, you wouldn't believe how many wires are happening in here. It's insane. But um, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And look forward to weekly mixes. I'm going to be trying to create this sort of, like, synth wave, cinematic, horror, ambient, dark beats kind of grave techno sound and uh on the one hand it could be kind of cool as like low volume level background music for your your tabletop sessions but also it's just the kind of weird crap that i listen to so if you're into that stuff you're going to love the dungeon dj i'm going to be coming up um we're going to be using mixed cloud because obviously you know youtube has some copyright stuff going on so thanks everybody for tuning into the opening sort of salvo in that new battle but we are not here to talk about that today no we're drinking coffee on Sunday morning. We got the jammies on. I know you got the jammies on. So we're going to switch over to Photoshop here. And there's probably going to be a moment where there's no sound. So you're just going to have to... You're probably going to be looking into infinity. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> okay, can you hear me there? I think you can. So that's cool. We're going to bring that down a bit. There we go. Sounds good to me, guys. Sounds good to me. Let's go over to Photoshop. All right. So, as you guys may have gleaned, intuited, or otherwise gathered from ye old uh, video description, we're back into our comfort zone right now today, and we are going to be talking about ye old world building. Oh, boy. One of the topics that is just... Seminal. You know, I don't even fully know what seminal means. It's just like what smart people say about things that you do over and over. Okay, so world building. There's a bunch of techniques. There's a bunch of fun to it, right? Um, and here, let me just, I'm going to put you through infinity again just so I can check my tech. Is everything in my tech going good? Yeah, okay, great. world building. Now I wanted to introduce sort of three techniques. Now remember that all these new streams, these are about this new concept, this concept called the RPG Underground. The RPG Underground is you guys. It is the creators of homemade 
RPG content. And what I want to do is put myself out in the sort of in the open, so to speak, about how I do a lot of stuff I do that led me into publishing. Now, is publishing, you know, something that I know anything about? Not really, but I sort of bumbled my way into doing pretty good with my opening set of attacks. And I want to share a lot of some of the mindset and, and visual tools that I use to get there. Okay, so let's get ourselves a nice little title up here so we, we never forget what we're doing. World building. Now, you guys know that I am notorious for my um, statement that the best way to be a dungeon master and to plan D&D content is one session at a time, right? Keeps you focused, keeps you from getting overwhelmed, it keeps you from supplanting player choices with your big DM dream. In the case of publishing though, in the case of creating more robust material, you can't do that. There's not a lot of fun market out there for one session worth of planning and it's like two little rooms or something and maybe some RP like that just doesn't make a very robust piece of published work. And so you're faced with this challenge. Well, I want to make something bigger. How do I do it? Now you're faced with a more traditional, I need to build out this world. Okay, so I want to propose three methods that you can do to build a more robust sort of setup for a world. And some of these come from sort of video game methodology. Some of them come from more traditional like RPG methodology. And then one it leaves you a little bit hanging, but we do see more of that um, in some older games and then in some of uh, newer games that are kind of adopting this strategy. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna do a tree, we're gonna do a wheel, and we're gonna do a sprout. Okay, so let's kind of zoom in and, and get, get funky. I don't wanna zoom in. Well, I'm a little bit zoomed in. Okay, there we go. Let's get funky with it. All right, what is a world for your players? Okay, I'm just gonna start drawing and I'm gonna pretend like I, I have some kind of plan here, but I really honestly don't. I just have a vague concept. What are these? I don't know, they're nodes. Now I'm connecting the nodes. Now remember, a huge part of relieving the fear of being creative on paper is to start working before you know what you're doing. If you know what you're doing or you wait to find out what you're doing before you really get started, you will never begin. <laughs> you will never begin. What does that mean? I don't even know. Okay, here's my tree. I'm going to say that each one of these nodes is not a session, is not a fixed piece of gameplay, but more like a sort of a waypoint. Okay, so my first waypoint, you can conceptually start to see what this can be, right? But I'm gonna keep myself from adding any theme to it just quite yet. This is just where they start. Remember, I'm just looking for the most vague, silly concepts I can find. And then maybe I'll come up with some dice tools or sort of just play a little bit to have fun and try to realize where this is headed. Okay, so now I'm just kind of going on, on intuition here. This is sort of looks like a side quest to me. And so does this one. These don't look like the ending. And then I want to call this, and this is really coarse, but look, I'm just going to lay it down. Victory and defeat. Another thing that can help you when you're building worlds or campaigns is to embrace the concept of victory and defeat rather than seeing defeat as some kind of bad end. Defeat can be really cool. A great example of this is the, um, the King Arthur movie with Clive Owen. Now in that movie, really they kind of don't win. They kind of get screwed up and killed and like they kind of, it doesn't work out very good. But the path that they go through as human beings on the journey to that sort of final defeat, which in a way is a victory, is the fun of it, okay? And so if I put the word defeat on a world building piece that I'm doing as a dungeon master, I know that a lot of a lot of you, because you're like me, have this weird gland inside you that goes, huh, what are you doing? No, don't do that. Don't don't plan out their inevitable doom. That's just like, yeesh, that's gross, man. Talk about taking away their choices. But that's kind of not the point. The point is more where the tone of this story might go. Remember, defeat as 
a momentary problem, yeah, that can be a little depressing. Like we all wiped out and like all got killed when we were fighting the Beholder and we got set way back, lost a bunch of our gear. One of our guys doesn't even know who he is anymore. We're all confused and, oh man, this is, this is like the middle of that second Avengers movie where they're all like disoriented and like Hulk crashes into that thing, you know, and they're all split up and, you know, Thor is in that like tuna can. Anyway. Om Ganahe. Now I'm just going to start giving category names to these nodes and then we're going to break it down like what we're, what we're thinking, okay? We've got a reveal. We've got light. We've got dark. We've got above. We've got below. And then we're going to switch it. We've got royal court and the under king. I have no idea what the under king is, but I'm just flipping it. You see what I did? I've been doing like all goody two shoes stuff on the right, and then I flipped it toward the end. Why? I have no idea. I'm thinking with the right brain, not the left brain. I don't know what this is yet. Maybe that's why I'm stalling and talking. Okay, so each one of these lines represents progression through your gameplay. If you have more than one line coming out of a node, you've got choices. Players will probably invent other choices, and that's fine too. These are two-way. So remember, you're not necessarily trying to set up a big game that just plays as written. You're publishing RPG material. So your goal here is to create sort of excitement in a dungeon master where they might see, oh, you know what I could do? I have that crazy Kenku monk who wanted to do something about like the ice world, and that's all he gave me. But maybe what I could do is, and then here we're about to do that. So I'm gonna need a copy of the tree, and we're gonna start to decode what this stuff could be. Check it out. Now remember, I'm always sort of talking as if I know what I'm doing, but I have no idea where this stuff is headed. I, I'm totally honest that I, do, I don't think about anything but the absolute start of the video before I just hit the button. So, we gotta break this down, you guys, and we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna list from the bottom up because that's how right-brained we are. Okay, so the start. Now here's where you need to think about something that a DM who's reading this can really sink his or her teeth into the content you're proposing. So I like this idea of this Kenku. I like the idea of there's this ice sort of, um, force of some kind. So how does it start? Well, let's just run with the Kenku concept. And I've done too many escapes. So let's do sort of a, a calling. Like birds are always calling, right? The calling. Heroes are summoned by the Kenku. Okay, so Already, about a billion decisions just got made for me. But your job as the creative like jellyfish, as the, as the loose amoeba of where you're taking this, is to not question or judge any of those sort of answers that are all starting to form themselves, right? The minute we have a Kenku society, they're probably living in giant trees. They have like wooden technology. They use like cool sound and calls and whistles and, you know, bird sounds to communicate in some fun way. And then the calling itself, ooh, that suggests something is happening and they need help from heroes. That's you guys, your players. There's a lot already being implied here. And I've also got this sort of Kenku focused world, which is like, what the hell? I've never done that, that's fun. So we've got like one that's like a raven, one that's like an albatross, you know, and like they're sort of different bird personalities and I could mine that for a few ideas of sort of who's doing what. Almost like the Skeksis in a way, right? There's sort of one that's kind of dark and sinister, but then there's the leader who's good and oh man, all this stuff is just starting to, but let's stick to our tree. Now we have reveal. So the summoning is not easy. So this right here, that little thing, that is the fun of getting to the calling, or what can I call it getting there alive. And there you've got your first night of gameplay and your first real adventure. That little dotted circle 
is your first piece of fun. The Kenku Council summons the heroes to help. Your heroes, because they're freaking awesome and they represent this land that they live in and cherish, are going to answer the call. But to even reach Sky Tree or whatever, it's not an easy thing. The woods around Sky, Chi Sky Tree have been like, you know, they've become corrupt. And sure, it's a level one adventure, so why not throw some giant spiders in there? <laughs> they need to struggle their way through the forest. And the evil forces that are gathering are already trying to stop them because if they join forces with the Kenku, this is not going to be good. So that's your first adventure is getting to the calling alive. So now you've got, you've got meat on the bones. What's the reveal? The reveal is that the Kenku basically lay out this idea. This whole thing up here is what is revealed in, in part by the moment of the reveal. So we're going to say the Kenku sort of um, tell of a growing evil. And um, we're just going to call it the talisman for now. Do I have any idea what the talisman is? No, but I know that when there's evil growing, you need this like relic. It's the first piece in the puzzle to resist them, okay? The, the Kenku are going to raise an army. They know that they're going to meet the Underking in battle, but they don't know where and they don't know when. They need this relic to get started. But then the raven comes up out of the darkness, okay? so. This is where we get our first real big choice. Now, maybe during the summoning or the calling, while this is being revealed, the Kenku tree is attacked. And this whole piece of RP is revealed during combat. So I'm going to just say that, say during attack. So great tree is burning. There's Kenku running everywhere. It's total chaos. And they're also trying to tell you, we've got to get this thing. But then the, the raven comes out of the shadows says you're all fools. The relic will do nothing. It's already too late. The only way is to strike at the head of our enemy immediately. The dark path. We must take the dark path. The relic is, is a fool's route. There is no peace, right? And then the bright leader of the Kenko says, you're always saying this dark shit, man. You're so dark. But the players now are facing a very cool choice. So on the dark side, we have kill the under king. These are two very different options for players to explore. And here's where you're not giving someone who's reading your published material the answer. You're posing this right here, an excruciating choice for players. Do you guys want to go on basically like a artifact hunt to retrieve this relic, come back and build a defense force and hold the world against this dark threat? or? Do you want to take the dark path, the raven path, power yourselves up into these assassins and just sneak in and kill the enemy king? These are your two choices. Now, the variation around these choices, players are going to have a lot of ideas and input, especially if you've got like some nice sort of, um, you know, type role play interaction going with the sort of leader NPC, right? Players are probably going to already start intuiting their own plans, maybe, you know, thinking about the lay of the land and stuff like that. But also at this moment, really at this moment right here, the world map becomes important. Right as they make this choice and set out, in quotes, you know, they're sort of going to do the stuff, they're going to want to see some form of world map. I totally disagree with that recent blog post that said world maps are not for players and characters. I do not believe that. I think. Cool RPG characters always have a rolled up world map in their pouch and it's how they navigate the world. It doesn't necessarily look like a National Geographic map. It might look more like a medieval map, but either way, they're gonna wanna know where stuff is so they can go try to do things. This side quest here is just dark power. They need to go get the, the dagger of ultimate Vorpal killing. Then they need to go down through these tunnels to try to find the Underking. Tunnels to sneak. See how everything starts to get quicker now? <clears throat> but now we've got another one of these crazy choices right here. Let me just hold right there. Meanwhile, on the Relic Hunter side, we have this choice. 
do they want to, we're going to give them basically a similar thing. No, actually, screw it. Screw power. Power is for the dark half. This is rescue. So during the attack on Great Tree, one of the Kenku council members is kidnapped. And they're probably going to torture him and try to get secrets out of him and stuff like that. And as a side mission, you could go rescue him. Or, again, the darker council is to leave him to his fate and make for the relic. Because time is of the essence in this world, okay? So this is a side quest that's a rescue. Now we're in the above. So I think above to me sounds like, like a castle or ruins. Castle ruins. Right there. Still no choice. They're looking for the relic. They find it. They interact with some NPCs. This relic turns out to be clutch in the creation of a defensive army force. And now we have our confrontation, at least the first primary one, with the Underking right here. And it's like sort of a military siege, you would call it. So while this big siege is happening, there's a cool little side sort of possibility that the players can do to, you know, be part of the effort, the war effort, to sabotage maybe... Maybe the Underking has like a gigantic trebuchet and all he really needs is one shot with this big burning meteor and it's going to destroy a great tree. And the players just need to go and sabotage that and it's going to break their lines and then the, the soldiers are going to pour in. You know, something like that. And then we come to this. So this whole side of the tree, this side of the tree, has this feeling of Minas Tirith, of... The, the bastion of the world is under assault and we're going to hold. This entire side feels like that's a fool's route. Only, only fools play out the most important battles on the battlefield. The real warriors are in the shadows and that's this entire site. Now, what's interesting is this. This is the weirdest node we have. So we're, we're on these tunnels going to sneak in to fight the Underking and then somehow that's going to lead us into the royal court. How is that? To me... I wrote that down before knowing what it means, but now I think I might see it. There is an alliance, a, a treacherous alliance between the Underking and the current king of the realm, who isn't one of the Kenku. This is like in, in Alfheim, like King Henrik or King uh, Akram, like the king of king of kings, and they've all been in cahoots. So actually, when it's time to go after the Underking, you find yourself facing the treacherous alliance. You're like, no, no. The Underking is just an agent of the official government. No, and then there you guys are. Your players in the middle of this super awkward snafu where they have aligned themselves against the powers that be and they cannot defeat those powers. King Henrik has 20,000 soldiers, all of equal quality to the heroes on the ready. You cannot defeat these guys. And so you need some new choice. And I think in this case, it's escape. And boy, this would be a great moment for a player to lose his life or her life defending to buy time for people to escape this unwinnable snafu at the royal court. Great character death. So epic and legendary as this is built up. Remember, this is um, the span of time it takes to do this is at least knowing my campaigns would be something like three months. And designing beyond that distance, I think you're getting into the realm of bigger publishers. And honestly, I find it unusable. I really loved like the first maybe five to ten pages in Forbidden Lands, for example, when they get into their whole campaign world, their sandbox world. But then it goes on so long, I start to go blurry on it. So I kind of just stopped. I really liked the beginning in Forbidden Lands, and I, I didn't want to read so much of it, I went numb. I think Wizards of the Coast is a little bit um, on trial right now for this approach. They, they've given us like 50 years of gameplay. It's just, it's a little much. The books get a little big, and you just get like sort of, I don't know, your eyes kind of cross, like driving at night for too long. <laughs> anyway, so think of this as about three months. The reason that this victory is here is because they chose the light side. They chose the to fight a fair battle. And we need to make that victory sort of a little bit bittersweet too. So you can add some details here about how the Underking, you know, actually was sort of building this secret rebellion. And it's really the main king who's kind of the bad guy. And that's also revealed, but it's revealed as the Underking is defeated. 
So you still wind up in the same exact place, which is right here, which is we now have an evil king. And it's not the under king. Remember, he's just an agent. The main king of the realm, turns out, is evil. And we've only just begun. Okay? So, I know I've created a little bit of a mess here. But you could see the fun of as this is unfolding. And you have some kind of cool, nice looking version of this. And you're kind of doing this, you know, as you go. <laughs> and then, oh, the players invented some stuff right here. And then we wound up doing this. And then there was an unforeseen thing here. And we did this and saved that guy. He was a fruit vendor. And then we got back into this. You know, this all this kind of stuff. It's a bit of a mess, but I think you guys can see what I mean by a tree technique, okay? The tree is a series of branching choices. And these branching choices lead to a few predicted outcomes. There might be outcomes that you didn't predict as the DM, but remember, you're trying to publish some work. You're trying to create something someone else could read and get excited about. So you have to make a few choices that are predictive. Now, player agency is always going to win out over that. But as a creator, you're tabling that question for later. Okay, so there we go. There's our tree. Okay, which is kind of fun that it wound up being about the Kenku because, you know, Kenkus like trees. They birds, not me. <laughs> okay. They, they birds, B. They birds. All right, cool. So don't take my corn. He's a bird, man. You don't even know, man. What you crazy man? Don't make me get crazy man. Okay, there's our tree. Let's do the wheel. The wheel is the most common type of game design or world design that you see in video games. Okay, so we're gonna go top to tune. Remember, we're doing this thing where we kind of feel like we know what we're doing. This technique was also used by the Desert King, one of my favorite DMs out there, in his Sinfall campaign. All righty now, all righty now. Let's just kind of do this sort of thing. Look at this. It looks kind of like a wheel, right? Maybe like a silly wheel on a silly wagon driven by a silly man, but a wheel nonetheless. So when you do the wheel, and you're going to be adding things as you go, let's go back to our terms, our abstract terms. We've got start. We've got reveal. And we've got, this is what's crazy about the wheel. We've got victory and we've got defeat also in the hub. Okay, and now we have stuff we need to work out. So I need to do this whole exercise all over again. Remember, being creative, it's a muscle. You work the muscle, you get better at it. So we're gonna do that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Use a bird, y'all don't make me go crazy, dude. All right. You start in the middle. The Kenku have summoned our heroes. There is a dark power growing in the land, and we seven are the only hope to stop it. We all bear the mark of the bird, and they're like, ah! We get through some of those concepts. The tree is under attack, all this good stuff. The difference in the wheel is that you've got more choices that come straight off the first node. And these three isn't really that many more, right? So maybe you wanna, you're cool. You wanna do something like this. You're a cool guy. Oh, there I did it again. I drew another stinking pentagram. Okay, there we go. There we go. I draw them everywhere, I swear. Maybe that's actually part of the reveal is that the game world has this built-in pentagram. <laughs> I just like it. I see it as, as a symbol of ancient knowledge, magical power. It's It's gotten a bit of a bad name, but that ba bad name is washing away. Anyway, they have five choices here, and after each choice, they're going to return to the great tree. They're going to go out and retrieve the sword of Baldun. Then they're going to go and go defeat the, uh, the corporal of the underking who's been attacking on the western lands. Then they're going to return. Then they're going to go out and they're going to rescue the albatross, the council member, the great wise one. And then they're going to return. They hang out at the great tree for quite a while. In, the, in this version, they do not. They set out and they never go back. 
But in this one, they go out, they return. They go out, they return. They go out, they return. And then they reach a point and that leader of the Kenku says, you're ready. You must go find Gozak. Gozak is on the western frontier where he fights those terrible insects. And we'll say Gozak is right over here. And then Gozak, he becomes the new hub. So from Gozak, you go out and you fight the spiders. Then from Gozak, you go out, you find the undertomb with the ancient book. Then with Gozak, you go. So you see, this is a very different kind of adventure. This is the kind of adventure where players like to rest. They like to do crafting. They like to have a home base where they go and hide between their big ordeals. In some ways, they build more lasting relationships with NPCs when they're using a wheel rather than a tree. But there's one really difficult piece with the tree, or the wheel, with the wheel. And it is doing this. How do you get resolution on this story? And just like all the great Zelda games, you always have to return to the beginning for the big finale. Always. And a lot of times in Zelda, they will show you the ending and it's not accessible right at the beginning. Like, look, here's the thing you can't do yet or that is, hasn't been resolved that you someday when you're super powerful, you're going to fix this thing. It's going to be crazy. But in the meantime, go do all this other stuff. So in an RPG, how do you do this? How do you make this motion happen? One of the easiest ways, the most boneheaded ways, is to do like a pursuit. Okay, so you get further out in the world, you become more powerful, more relevant, you're doing more things. Maybe, here, let's switch to red. Maybe um, you actually sort of get some of this going, where you, you jump to a, a different sort of thread, and you get a new hub, and you start doing this hub behavior kind of out here. Maybe this is the sort of the dark assassin type path. Down here is like the relic type path. Up here is Gozak, who we are going to draw in just a second, because we have to. So maybe despite all that happening, you still wind up where I want to pull him back to Great Tree for the big finale, right? And this is where maybe the Kenku that you uh, bargained with at the very beginning, like reveals himself to be the under king and he's in cahoots with the real king and you've chased him back to his own sanctum. He's got you right where he wants you. It's a huge betrayal. You're like, no, we don't want to fight you. And he's like, it's the only path. I'll destroy you before I yield. Bah! And then there's this huge battle. Turns out he's this mega badass. Whoa, super cool. Now you guys, if victorious, have inherited Great Tree. If defeated, you have to flee. And look, you get right back where we were before with an escape style ending to the story. They must leave Great Tree. And as they do, it's like burning and evil has taken over. And now they have a brand new ultra enemy, which is the Kenku are now dark creatures. Blah, blah. So anyways... The exercise here is to run with it. Get your sense of where this is all going and then do what we're gonna do in the next video in a few days, which is start to break it down into a processable verbiage. This is the hardest part. But for now, we're still just working on creative technique. Okay, so that is the wheel. Now let's talk about the sprout. The sprout is the silliest one. Okay, so now in the sprout, you have this going on, and here it comes, the T word. Every one of these little dudes, let me get some red so you can see. Doot, 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 doot. Uh, every one of these little gooseberries on here boop, boop, is a mofrogan table. Yep, a roll table. Roll 1d6. You are going to go, Zach. You are going to the tunnels. You have to fight the troll. You need to guard the border, whatever, right? You do not know which one of these is going to be rolled, and a lot of people enjoy this style of gameplay. This is sort of the uh, absolute tabletop model as well, like in um, Shadows Over Drift Chapel, which is a brilliant little book um, that gives you this kind of, here's a theme that might happen. Roll 1d8, and you're just like, huh? And it's like, there's an evil nun. <laughs> so the evil nun might be right here. And, you know, she's working to reveal the treachery of the Kenku, but she's being treated like a political prisoner. And you didn't see that coming, but you rolled it. And that can be fun.
Now there's a little bit of a trade-off here with doing the table method. And you got to watch out for this stuff. On the one hand, it's very fun to create these. We all, as Dungeon Masters, love making thematic tables that are super fun to roll on. Roll 1d10 for what you find in the skeleton's skull, you know. Roll 1d10 for the object in the corpse's hand, you know, whatever. Roll 1d6 to see which direction the dungeon twists next. We all love making these things. They're really fun to write. But they are way less fun to play. This is why with a lot of roll table driven systems and content, it does suggest like maybe use this as part of your prep rather than doing it right during play. Tables are really cool. Lord knows I love them. Uh, Blood and Snow, my sort of Ice Age supplement, is all about table driven gameplay. Did you play at the table, you know, like rolling so that even the GM is surprised and like you're all sort of going through it together. To me, it never has the sublime feeling of creative brilliance that the tree and the wheel have because it is table driven. The, the, the very fact that tables are kind of creating this makes some of the sort of uh, the, the intermeshing gears of a really compelling story, they, they touch a little bit less. They kind of slip a little bit here and there. But for people who enjoy the table style of, of playing, that's the very fun that they seek, is explaining these kind of odd results that tables can give. But all that said, if you are an RPG undergrounder, a creator, this third style, the sort of the table-driven sprout, you're watching it grow in ways you don't really fully predict, can be the most expedited to create and write. These first two require some degree of experience and sort of creative confidence to construct machinery that will function. Whereas this one says, hey, you're a good dungeon master. Here's just several of my ideas that are randomly selectable. And maybe you're going to randomly select these and find yourself in some fun situations. That's really what the Sprout says. And so as a creator and as a writer, it takes a lot of the heavy lifting off of you. And that's cool. But deep down in my soul, um, I've always felt that playing off of roll tables is just not quite as awesome. So definitely if you feel otherwise about that, throw it down in the comments and let's that's a that's a discussion for the ages right there. Okay, so Gozak. Let's just uh, bear with me for a minute while I'm thinking about Gozak, okay? So Kenkus have beaks and they always have hoods. So I, I think I want to try a little bit of a different angle on this one. A good trick for drawing a hood is to draw a diamond like this. I know a lot of people have trouble doing hoods. And put a couple of blobs around the side and a little bit extra mass on the top and there you go. So see how like my hood came together? But now I'm like this hood isn't like evil enough and so what you do is you take your diamond and you crush it like that. And that's how you can very easily draw a hood without having to understand all the 3D that's going on in a hood. Now, Someone who actually knows how to draw could give you a, a, a you know, a real, quote unquote, real method for drawing the 3D geometry of a hood. But you guys know me. I don't know how to do what I do, so I have to come up with tricks. This is like a sort of decorative sort of seam work on the hood, and then you can kind of put a line up here with little stitches on it. This is, this is Gozak. And Gozak is this sort of, this crow kenku. So yeah, I'm just getting a lot of black built up here, but that's okay. There we go. So now I can kind of penetrate into this blackness. And there's very little here. See, I'm just gonna do this really minimalistic kind of look. Because Gozak is, is an enigmatic figure and that's okay. And he has this kind of like shroud or cowl like this. And I'm not sure why, but he's got like, you know, this sort of feather decoration stuff. And you know, you can always have fun with like stick and feather motifs when you're working with Kenkus. So you see, I just, 
I took a round blobs there and made little white eye dots and then I took my black and you just run right over the top of them and you get that sort of more mean look. Um, so, so why am I switching to drawing Gozak? Is this really so important? Yes, it is important. You must never question the finger painting mind. The finger painting mind will want to do strange things that seem out of order or that seem sort of arbitrary or even sort of creatively selfish. Like, I don't want to finish my publishing project. I just want to draw a bird guy with a hood on that looks kind of mean and ambiguous. Okay, cool. Well, rock on then, dude. Because remember, our, our primary objective whenever we're creating content or whenever we're doing our hobby in general, in my opinion, is to have fun. Because if you have fun, you get the positive endorphins. It reinforces the activity and the time spent doing our hobby, the resources you put into it, your paycheck, those ducats. And that positive reinforcement just makes it fun to do the hobby. So here he is. You got like cool little wing hands, right? Like that. And I'm already getting tired of drawing him. Like I, I really don't need much more. I just wanted a really simple like suggestion of who he is. So I'm just gonna cut this off. I'm just gonna fill it in with black. And you're gonna see why I, I kind of wanted to draw him besides just being a right brain weirdo. God, I get that error message like at least 300 times per day. Okay. Um, so what did I do just there? I just let my hand loosely just make a mess. And a lot of times it can, it can really loosen up your drawings in a fun way. If you just let yourself draw some stray lines, it just adds a little dirt to your to your world that just makes things feel natural. Okay, so there we go. And then I'm gonna just whoosh, 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 whoosh. a little close. Okay, so I'm just framing him. Why am I framing him? Because remember, go all the way back to why we're here. We're here to publish or create RPG material that is for others to consume. And you need this stuff. You need it. You need things that put the image into someone's head. Like, oh, okay, we're dealing with like bird dudes that got hoods on. <laughs> now that may seem obvious, right? Because we all kind of know who Ken Guar and all this stuff. But you're talking to a stranger about your idea. Let's go back here. This one's kind of fit for it. So here's your idea. It's going to be in your um, your RPG content in some interesting and easy to digest way. It's going to look great. And then, pow, you've got Gozak right here. And Gozak, Gozak speaks a hidden truth. You know, so you got this cool caption. It's very evocative. You're not even sure as the person reading this what that means, but you're excited to get in there and find out. And that is the art of creating consumable material. Is one, give a GM the capability to sit at the table and execute. And in this case, I still like this first one the most. Um, right here. Getting to Great Tree Alive. That sets the tone for your game. I love that idea. I mean, I don't know, am I tooting my own horn? No, I'm just excited about what's happening here. This is all happening live in front of me just as much as you. So I love the idea of the Kenku send out this cool, like, resonant bird call. And the heroes know, oh no, it's time. They're calling us. We've got to go. And then they're going through the woods. And as they approach Great Tree, all these perils start revealing themselves. And it becomes very dangerous just to reach Great Tree. And that's your first night of adventure. That feels tight to me. So that's the first gift you really want to give someone who's spending the time to read your material. That first really usable, simple, non-negotiable piece that is gameplay. That's just going to get people at the table and move things, set it in motion. Then who knows what can happen. But I really believe the beginning is so clutch when it comes to published material. Okay. So we've got the wheel, we've got the uh, the tree, we've got the sprout, we've got our sort of bird NPC here. And I think we're like, we're just about done. So now it's just a matter of coming back to our core principles. Let's do that. Right, just like in the, in the wheel design. We're gonna come home 
at the ending. And it's going to end there. So world building. Now, I left out so much stuff. Building terrain, having a sense of space that's convincing, making a neato map, having fronts, as they're called in Dungeon World, right? Which is like sort of, you know, entities of threat in your world. All this other stuff, NPCs, all this stuff. But all those things are subservient to those core concepts. The tree, the wheel, and the sprout. How you're going to plan out your world. What your starting concept is. For me, it became this entire Kenku betrayal thing. I had no, I had no idea. Here's your priorities. Playable start. And here's why I want to write these down. This is our final piece here for this stream where we're going to be done. Then we have planned routes and big finales. So we talked about the three methods, but you're not going to be putting all three methods into your published piece. That would be insane. Your job or your burden as the creator of this content is to make a choice on your method execute that method, but you're probably not even going to show that method in your piece. This is the stuff you're going to show. This is the stuff you're going to show right here. In addition to other things like we talked about, terrain, NPCs, enemies, you know, all that other stuff that is so fun to create. And we'll, we'll keep doing that as the streams continue. But this, my, my brothers and sisters, this is one of the most important parts of your entire piece. The table of contents. This is the first time in your book or your pamphlet or your PDF where you're going to commit. You're going to say, this is what's in the book. Boom. A playable start. That is the title of your first section. A playable start or some such. So many books hit me with theme and stuff before I'm ready or hit me with mechanics and like rehash talk when I don't want to hear it. They don't get me excited. What I mean by that is have you ever noticed that a lot of RPG books start by describing to you what an RPG is? <laughs> do we really need to do that 20,000 more times in 2019? Uh, I don't think so. I think, yeah, okay. Anyway, I'm guilty of it too a little bit. In some of my stuff, I've said, you know, describe, roll, react. Like that's the fundamental thing we're doing here, right? It's There's something about it that's so tempting when you're writing an RPG book. So if you really feel the need to say that, like what, what an RPG is, this is my personal learning, by the way. I wish I would have done this in my books. I didn't. So I'm not coming at you from a higher, higher than, holier than thou, like this is the best way to do things. This is my current state of learning. This is the coolest start to a book, a playable start. And then what you do is you use that playable piece of content to introduce, this is how this RPG plays. This is how the dice get used. Here's how we're going to muck about. Here's what table talk is all about. And it's you want to know those things because you have a playable chunk of content. So one of the things that has brought me back to RPG Underground, back to doing these streams, is I am in the middle of doing this. This is all completely honest look at where I'm at creatively right now. ICRPG, Index Card RPG, has exploded beyond my wildest dreams. It's fantastic. But it's also going to be done after its fourth book. And then it's just going to be getting into, you know, adventures and community support and playing and enjoying it. For me as a creator, it's time for me to really be working on my next whole line of games. Or of, you know, a system, another big work. And so as I look back on what I've done in the last three years and forward to my new design, I'm facing so many hard questions. Because you have to ask, why not just continue with what you created? It's good. It's pretty decent. Why not just keep going? And because the creative impulse wants me to evolve and learn, and that's why I want to share that evolve the learnings with you guys. <laughs> I am an orator. And I will now switch back to...
144 viewers. That's our biggest stream of all time. Hey, hey, thanks for tuning in, everybody. You guys are the best. Sunday morning, man, does it feel good or what? Go uh, hug your fam, stay close to your loved ones, and by all means, in the name of all we hold dear, and make this world just a tiny little more bet bo better than it was yesterday, all right? Get out there and make somebody smile today, okay? Peace on earth, whatever you're going through out there, I hope you can get through it. Hold on and always believe. Tomorrow just going to be a tiny little bit better to den to den to der to der to der to der to der to der. All right, you guys. I'll catch you out on that internet. Thanks for tuning in, everybody.